Welcome to Abuja, the place that unites Nigeria. Hello and welcome. It's time for another interesting package of everything music. Angeli, Angelina, you the cool in my temperature. If you call, I go and deliver. This is Stoky Movies. In times of old, the world was full of wonder. No, 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 no. Welcoming you to your weekend for today. Arise, oh, come patrol. It's time to use our voice. Beyond six packs. Bills, 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 bills. Welcome to Gallery. Me and my parties. London for what? London for, for medicine. medicine. Medicine for what? Medicine, medicine for, for coffee. <laughs> Are you sickness? You are illness. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Just Zone. All right, my name is the S. Lucien Wego One. Ona nyoko konyo nyo. We only talk about rights, there are obligations. I'm not saying that this government is a saint, it's very far from it. But there are things that we can do to make it better, and that's the challenge I'm throwing to you. You don't want to build this nation? I don't know where else you want to go. If I had a choice, I'll come back. But I stand outside and I hear what you have. President Buhari engages Senate President on some critical national issues. When we have any section of our party disagreeing with something, we should, we should, we should be engaging. That's why we are politicians. Our Progressive Congress gets date for national convention. We, we think the party and the president might, might graciously consider February and president is favorably disposed. Nigerian government tasks African first ladies to drive peace processes as Nigeria's first lady emerges president of organizations peace mission. On Good Morning Nigeria today, we shall discuss achieving sustainable peace in the Southeast region of the country. <coughs> All right, for some time now, the security challenges in the country, particularly in the Southeast, has been of great public concern, especially to the leadership. Well, in the past year alone, uh, a number of public facilities were destroyed and government officials killed why businesses were paralyzed arising from the actions and others of non-state actors. And those others, of course, included sit at home. And the apprehension was high towards the Anambra State governorship election. And that's, of course, as the gun unknown gunmen, they are called, threatened to disrupt the polls. But with the mass deployment of security personnel, the exercise went well and is now history. But still worried uh, over the degenerating security situation in the Southeast region, some preeminent Igbo leaders visited President Muhammadu Buhari last week uh, to find a lasting solution to the lingering security challenges facing the region. At that meeting, uh, leader of the delegation, the first Republic parliamentarian and former Minister of Aviation, Mbazuli Amici, described the situation in the Southeast as, and I quote, painful and pathetic, unquote. Now, he lamented 
biz that businesses have collapsed, that education is crumbling, and that there is fear everywhere. Indeed, uh, Chief Amechi pleaded for a political rather than a military solution, requesting that uh, if Namdi Kanon, that's the leader of IPOP, was released to him as the only first uh, republic minister still alive, uh, he would no longer say the things that he had been saying. That is to say, Kanu would no longer be saying the things he had been saying. Chief Amechi also stressed that he could control him, not because he has anything to do with them, IPOP, but by virtue of his position as a highly respected personality in Igbo land. And, of course, uh, Chief Amechi concluded his remarks by saying, again, I quote, I don't want to leave this planet without peace returning to my country. I believe in one big united Nigeria, a force in Africa. Mr. President, I want you to be remembered as a person who saw Nigeria burning and you quenched the fire. End of quote. However, the president in his response said, but the demand you have made is heavy. I will consider it. So what needs to be done to achieve sustainable peace in the Southeast? What role show political, religious and traditional leaders and indeed subnationals play in achieving sustainable peace in the region? What are the strategies to be employed to end all the crises afflicting the Southeast? What kept or what delayed the leaders from the region from taking what is necessary or appropriate steps to address the issue uh, before it degenerated to the level that we are experiencing? These are some of the questions, of course, uh, uh, on public uh, discourse, and we shall be extending those questions to our guests today as we will discuss the issue achieving sustainable peace in the Southeast. On this note, I welcome you to Good Morning Nigeria. It's Tuesday's edition. And I am Claire Dilabo Abdul Razak. Welcome. I'm Kingsley Osadolo. I join my colleague Claire to also welcome you to, to this program. And just to remind our viewers that some months ago on Good Morning Nigeria, we had taken on this uh, same topic on how to achieve peace uh, in the Southeast. That was at the height of the uh, wanton destruction that ravaged uh, a number of states uh, in the Southeast, as well as, of course, uh, the uh, assassination or the killings uh, of uh, not just uh, political uh, leaders, but also of prominent uh, persons, including the husband of uh, the late uh, Dora Akunyele. So that will be our conversation segment back again today as to what can be done to sustain the peace in the South is following from, of course, uh, the relative peace that mm -hmm. attended the Anambra governorship election and the visit last week by uh, prominent Igbo leaders to President Muhammadu Buhari. We are live on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. In the course of the program, we have our regular complimentary segments, business and newspaper review, plus others. For now, here is our colleague, Anne Jibuno, with the highlights of the morning news. Good morning, Anne. Good morning, Kingsley, and uh, good morning, Claire. Good morning, Nigeria. Here is the news. President Mahmoud Buhari engaged the Senate President Ahmed Lawan on some critical national issues, as well as bills passed by the National Assembly towards good governance and effective service delivery. I don't think there will be any day that you will have a political issue that everybody will say the same thing about it that agrees with you without any amendment. So when we have any section of our party disagreeing with something, we should, we should, we should be engaging. That's why we are politicians. I, I don't think uh, it is right to say that governors have disagreed. Uh, maybe some governors might have said they don't like it this way, but that's normal. In the meantime, the National Convention of the Governing All Progressives Congress is now to be held in February next year. President Mohamed Buhari gave this approval after receiving a briefing on the resolution of the Progressives Governors Forum on the matter. The forum, which held a meeting last night, mandated its chairman, Governor Tiku Bagudu of Kebi State, as well as his Yobe and Jigawa State's counterparts, to make its position known to the president. Christmas is around the corner, and then early January will be very busy with AKT. So the governors, based on all that, made an input that uh, 
we, we think the party and the president might, might graciously consider February and president is favorably disposed. Well, they will expect uh, more unity and progress. Uh, like he, the PGF chairman said, uh, they have suggested to the party and Mr. President has concurred. African First Ladies have been tasked to drive processes and actions aimed at enhancing the desired peace enterprise on the continent for sustainable growth and development. President Mohamed Buhari threw the challenge at the opening of the 9th General Assembly of the African First Ladies Peace Mission convened by the First Lady of Nigeria. Aisha Buhari. It is not in doubt that women and children are the worst affected by the breakdown of peace. Therefore, as mothers, I believe you are in better position to drive the processes of peace and actions where necessary. As important stakeholders in our respective countries, it is important for us to take on a more direct means of engaging society, to help minimize such violence and its disastrous effects on lives and property. And while Nigeria's First Lady Aisha Mohamed Buhari has emerged, the new president of the African First Lady's Peace Mission, this was part of the resolutions of the just concluded Executive Bureau meeting at the ninth session of the General Assembly of the organization, which took place in Abuja. With all sense of humility, I accept my election as the ninth, as the incoming ninth president of the African First, Le First Ladies Peace Mission. I want to sincerely thank all my colleagues for your continuous support and understanding for entrusting me with this great responsibility. I pledge to execute my responsibility with total commitment. The federal government is assuring Russia of deeper investment relationship that will be mutually beneficial as the world looks beyond the pandemic. At a meeting with a coalition of 19 Russian companies led by Nigeria's ambassador to Russia and Nigerian Investment Community, the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, Niyi Adebayo, assured them of adequate returns on investment. Our purpose of the presence in Nigeria now is to explore the demand of Nigerian market and to develop the strategy uh, the government of Nigeria will give every support to all the decisions that uh, will be taken between uh, the businesses, uh, all the B2B uh, B meetings that you'll be holding. Now there is a very strong feeling that it's necessary for Russia to, to come to Africa. Vice President Yemi Oshimbaju says higher institutions become globally recognized because of their active engagement in research. The vice president stated this when he received a delegation from the University of Lagos Alumni Association, led by the national president, John Momo. The vice president said focus should be on research, as this is what puts nations on the world map of intellectual achievement and attainment. He called for more resources to be devoted to research, adding that Nigerian institutions such as the University of Lagos ought to be at the front line of scholarships and intellectual achievements. Well, that's the news for now. Good morning, Nigeria. Continues with Kingsley and Claire after the break. Thanks for staying with us. The digital switchover project, which is commonly referred to as DSO, which entails television channels switching from analog to digital broadcasting, is one of the biggest projects embarked upon by this administration. Branded as Free TV, offers its viewers about 60 digital channels including sports, music, movies, and news. The federal government has licensed about 23 set-top box manufacturers. Seven of them have set production, employing several thousands of people. We've made it now compulsory for all stations in Nigeria to only broadcast productions made in Nigeria for products which are produced in Nigeria. 
How to make a perfect bowl of love? A perfect blend of taste that brings every ingredient to life. The fusion of different spices. The unique aroma that rejuvenates your senses. The heartwarming deliciousness. And the satisfaction that comes from every bite, which makes you say, Hmm, I love my Indomie. solution we have developed is a multifaceted one. Uh, first we have tried to lead a program to build what we think will be an acceptable and hopefully affordable housing type based on surveys we did in 2015-2016 and construction that started in 2017. And that's going on in 24 states as the National Housing Program. This message is from the Federal Minister of Information and Culture. Uh, the NOA, for example, uh, has succeeded a great deal in sensitization during the pandemic. And we have found the community mobilization officers most effective in the sensitization and in the advocacy campaigns, creating awareness on the coronavirus uh, pandemic. We have done this through the, the production of jingles, which were very widely uh, distributed in different languages in English, in Hausa, in Yoruba, in Igbo, in Tiv, in Igala, in Kanuri, in Fulfulde, in Ijo, in Isoko, in, uh, in Bini. In, in talk of any other language you can think of, we had translated since translation messages. This message is from the Federal Minister of Information and Culture. and it's time for business news and the national action committee an africa continental free trade area afcta afcfta yes that's the correct uh, abbreviation afcfta engages governors forum to achieve viability in communities kunli adeye has details for us the national action committee on africa continental free trade area AFCFTA says it is working with the Nigeria Governors Forum to build economically viable communities to meet with the opportunities available in the single market. Francis Anatogu, secretary of the committee, says there is a target of seven goals with growing domestic demands. There is no silver bullet. That's number one. That's something to note. The second thing is that what we are doing will take time. It will take years. But part of what we are doing is get people to understand and see the potentials because we believe that when people see the potentials, when people can, and, uh, when people, uh, communities, states can see the potentials, then it will, it will catalyze um, action at every level. It's about policy making, policy implementation and, and all that. We've, we've done this well over time, and it's been possible for us to earn the respect of our principals. I mean, we believe in this at the secretariat level. That's why it's been possible to put this prominently on agenda. And I just hope that in the course of this, I mean, we will be able to not just understand how to assess, uh, meet those um, requirements, but how to uh, uh, ensure that services of their deck is uh, more efficient. And the equities market on Monday closed on a bullish note with the all share index climbing 0.14% at 43,260 .13 points and equity capitalization increased to 22.5 trillion naira. 2.4 billion shares valued at 16.4 billion naira were traded in 4,811 deals. With business news, I'm Kunle Adeyeye. Thank you very much, Kunle, for the business news package. Up next is New Super Review.
let's welcome Bayo Atayubi, who is already here in the studio to do the useful. Bayo, good morning. Good morning, Claire. Thank you. Good morning, Kinsley. Good morning, Nigeria. All right, Bayo, good to see you. Okay, yeah. let's start with the punch. And uh, the punch has at its headline, February 2022, APC convention date shaky, crisis persists in 12 states. And the two riders there, governors propose February to President Buhari for approval, says Bogudu, Rivers, AKT Ogun, Oyo, Zamfara, Kwara, Cross River, and others affected. And uh, the picture story, women better to drive peace process. And that's coming from President Mohamed Buhari. And uh, that's to the uh, First Ladies, uh, the gathering of the First Ladies yesterday. And uh, you see the President, African First Ladies Peace Mission, uh, that's at their ninth General Assembly. Uh, you can also see some of the uh, pictures there, uh, trending on the front page of the punch. Women better to drive peace process, says President Buhari. It's on page 27. You can read up details about that. Now, to other stories, WIAC releases 2021 WIAC results, uh, West African Schools Educate results, which holds 11%. Uh, details on page three. ICPC arranged FCT council chair for 10 million naira kickback. ICPC arranged FCT council chair for 10 million naira kickback. Details of that on page nine. And fire raises calls of shops in Kano Market, page nine. Uh, this, uh, this paper is quite um, uh, busy this morning. On the, at the bottom there, you find other stories. Treat oil theft as treason. Military policemen involved. Wiki, page three. Katsina bandits demanding cash. Others kill four in fresh attack, page 26. And travelers killings, kidnapping on Abuja, Kaduna Highway. Shameful and unacceptable. A ACF, details of that on page 27. Uh, let's take you to... A bit above the name plate and naira loses steam slides to 555 uh, naira to a dollar in parallel market it's on page 19 and um, 11,200 nigerian women children raped in 2020 that's statistics from un and capital inflow crashes by 80 percent Foreign investors show Nigerian market. Details of that on page nine. Kinsley. Okay, we also take a look at uh, the front page of the Nation newspaper. Uh, Nation from above the name flag, you have the following headlines. WAEC jacks up exam fees to 18,000 naira. WAEC jacks up exam fees to 18,000 naira. Uh, with the rider, 81.7% credit uh, recorded. That is in the results that have just been released. Wiki, that's the Kika, top military and police officers and others involved in oil theft. Declare bandits terrorists, says Casina Assembly. Federal government feeds 254,313 pupils in Plateau schools. Tortive, now this is the headline below the nameplate uh, fairness, equity, and inclusiveness, bedrock for sustaining peace. Details on page 27. Lagos has answers panel report controversy rages. Witness attacked with machetes. Sam alleges threat to life. Presidency. Federal government won't act on all parts of reports. Honeywell and flour mills in 80 billion naira major deal. A list story is on politics and uh, it says, Buni, why APC can't hold national convention now? Party to conclude congresses in four states, Buhari and governors settled for February. 16 billion naira hidden vote found in environment ministry's budget. Uh, you can see the photograph there on the front page showing President Muhammad Buhari alongside um, some African First Ladies at the opening of the 9th General Assembly 
of the Africa's First Ladies Peace Mission Summit that took place at the State House uh, Conference Hall in Abuja yesterday. ICPC docks Gwagwalada Council Chief over 10 billion naira bribe. Right. Thank you, Kinsley. Let's start with the political stories that uh, dominated the two reports uh, that were reviewed. Governors under the auspices of the Progressive Governors Forum are unable to agree on the mode of primaries. The punch reports that the meeting of the 22 APC governors ended without a consensus on the mode of primaries. They agreed to propose February 20, uh, 2022 for the convention of the party and also voted uh, their confidence in the May Malabuni led Kiatika committee. The issues of direct or indirect primaries became a war of words. The chairman, uh, KB State Governor, had to restore calm. In the briefing after the meeting, he said that the meeting with the president would determine the final decision. In the same vein, the Senate president also visited President Muhammad Buhari. Ahmed Lawan uh, thereafter affirmed that the 2022 appropriation bill will be passed before Christmas break. When asked about primaries controversy, he said, for us as the legislature, we have finished our job. Passing the electoral bill, it is now left for the president to engage his assistants and advisors to take the most appropriate action. Nigeria has now met the position of embarking on local manufacturing of vaccines. The limitations of uh, regulatory capacity that hitherto precluded Nigeria vaccine has been surmounted. The Director General of the Nigeria Agency for Food, Drug Administration and Control, Professor Mojisola Deye, who gave an update, says that NAGDAT had successfully met the last 368 recommendations given by the World Health Organization for Vaccine Manufacturing. In January 2018, the World Health Organization had given Nigeria 868 recommendation steps to be met. NAVDAC uh, had striven through the, over the months to uh, meet all the requirements. This was required for recognition to attain maturity level three. By October 2015, NAVDAC had met all the conditions and the recommendation is now waiting for invita invitation and inspection. The coast is now clear for Nigeria now to manufacture vaccines locally. The several conditions which was, which was imposed included the expansion and equipment, equipping of two major laboratories, one at Yaba, the other at uh, Oshodi, and this has been achieved. The World Health Organization will be sending a team of certification to, uh, as a prelude to issuance of a certificate. Um, there's been tragedy again, fire. Uh, Claire, there's this report you read about fire in Kano. This, when it's towards the end of December, during the dry season, there usually is a spit of fire around markets. Already there's fire in Kano, and that should be a warning signal across the nation. But in Port Harcourt, there's been fire consecutively over three days. The last one happened yesterday, where three children of the same parents and uh, two other persons were, were killed. The fire destroyed the Boni uh, Nembe jetty in Port Harcourt. Uh, it is the third fire coming uh, in, in succession. The first was, was an illegal oil bunkering outfit at Rumokoro. The fire on the, another fire on Saturday was ignited uh, at a diesel outfit along Isiopwe Street in Port Harcourt. This woman who was involved yesterday had a baby on her back. She left her three children on the jetty with the intention of buying something across from the market before coming back to the jetty. Unfortunately, the fire engulfed it and she lost all the three children. Punch reports that a witness at the jetty said a man suspected to be a loader at the jetty was spotted igniting a cigarette and there are fear that that could have ignited the fire. It is illegal to smoke in public places in Nigeria. There is the law against smoking in public places. The State Commissioner for Special Duties, Mr. Emeka Onoha, has asserted that River State Government will confiscate any property used for illegal uh, bunkering activities and prosecute all those, the owners. He accused community leaders and security agencies of sabotage for not 
reporting and taking illegal uh, actions against Boko Haram. Mm -hmm. And that has been reiterated by Governor Yeso Wiki, who is saying that there's collusion between some security agencies and community leaders about this uh, Boko Haram thing. Mm -hmm. hey, let's let's uh, pick out some very uh, important stories and, and talk about it. We have just a few minutes uh, to get. I don't know if Kinsley has uh, any on the... No, that's not, that's not... Okay, there's this two, two, two tragic stories at the airport. Uh, an air traffic controller of the Nigeria SP management, a general manager for that matter, uh, Neka Efiong, unfortunately went on duty, reported at 6 p.m. He was to close uh, by 7 a.m. Unfortunately, at 4 a.m., he slumped. He was rushed to uh, the Air Force clinic, and sadly, we lost him. Mm -hmm. uh, and in another sad development, a Nigerian Air Force woman also died of snake bite. She went to the restroom to use the restroom in her flat, and she was beaten by a snake. She was very courageous. She took her children to her neighbor's house to keep, and then went to the clinic for treatment. Unfortunately, uh, there was delay in, in administering venom on her, and eventually, we lost her too. I don't know, but, uh, be, but if, you, if you look at the, the front uh, page of the punch, yes. it's uh, as if the issue of rape, uh, because this is very important. The UN has given some statistics for just 2020 alone. 11,200 200, uh, Nigerian you know, women and children raped in 2020. And the front page of Al Jazeera is also talking about a professor in a tertiary institution who has also defied a 13-year-old girl. And you begin to wonder what, you know, what is going on in their minds? What, what, what state of mind, you know, would a professor... You know? Yes, yesterday we reviewed that. And it was, the professor was described as a pedophile. There's no good in saying that fact. Here is the professor. In fact, the latest report indicated that he had done something similar to another girl, a 13 year old girl, and put that girl in the family way. And he owned up to accept the parenthood of, of the child. He got that child, but later on sent the, the girl away, and the girl is there on the street. And, and the ironically, ironically, that girl now she's, he's alleged to have raped was brought from the village to look after the baby that was given birth to by the first girl he had actually put in the family way. Oh my goodness. So uh, the good thing is that uh, the security agencies and all the law enforcement agencies are over, over him. He has been arrested and he is to face the music accordingly. I, th I, th I think the music he should face shouldn't be the, the business as usual music. That professor who is, you know, in the habit of, who is in the habit of doing that should be, I, I don't know what kind of punishment should be given to him, but it's, it's very sad. The punishment uh, is there according to the law. Bio, okay. Um, YX says uh, this year's results improved. Yes, considerably. Uh, that's yes. a cheery news. Uh, the percentage of students who got the required uh, credit in five subjects, including English and math, has improved. Uh, but again, my worry is the, the story that Kingsley read. YX fee, now people are to pay 18000 not even jump fee is as expensive as that. Hmm. What? How many people can afford to pay 18000 for West African Examination Council examination? Some elected uh, persons often take it as part of their constituency project to pay wire fees for uh, candidates from their constituencies. Some state governments also issue uh, statements when they say they have uh, taken over the payment of wire fees for all qualified candidates in their state. So maybe that's some form of buzzery that uh, the candidates can expect from political office leaders. I, I don't but understand. I, I, I mean, I'm sure WIAC will have uh, their reasons for increasing their fees. The cost of production of everything is virtually going Is that true? No if question I, I, about that. And then I imagine also that uh, you know, the cost of payment for the examiners, it's also going up. So it's not, uh, they will have to take these exam papers uh, through some of the same routes that uh, people avoid to travel on. And if they are utilizing alternative routes, if that alternative means of logistics, either flight or otherwise, that also raises their cost. I'm not their spokesperson, but it's for them to defend mm. uh, what, what they have done. The only thing that I think Afe Baba, Chief Afe Babala was uh, speaking to that yesterday uh, in one of the papers. I, I don't understand the, which, which YEC is this one. It used to be May, June. 
Then I, which one? Which one is this one? Then Neko will <laughs> write their own. And I, 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 I remember that, of course, in the past, you used to have November, December for uh, private uh, candidates. So which one you are see, they? Uh, that was GC, General mm, Certificate of... This work is the normal one that is done at the end of every academic year for secondary schools. In fact, the Afai Babalola you refer to mm. was even remarking during the convocation mm. that work is delaying... Admission. Uh, uh, delaying admission by not releasing their results because it is affecting uh, uh, students. When did they write this exam? They have written it a long time ago. The next WIC exam is the one that you're talking about. The, the May subsequent June. one, the, yes. The subsequent, not May, June. There's, I think, one that usually come around November, December. Yeah, I, I so. think well, this, I November, think November, is, November is ending next week. Which, which one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, Kisley, every, every, everything, everything has changed. <coughs> Academic calendar has changed. You don't even know. Usually, we used to, you know, go for the long vacation, you know, between June and October. And October, you know, it was a very long, yes. you know, holiday that we all looked forward to. As, as and, a student, and, I, and I, used used to do vacation saying, you know, I used to do vacation job. I used to do vacation job during that coming. period to supplement now my school people, fees. Children no longer sing holiday is coming. They don't, they no, no longer looking forward to that three, two months in a long holiday. So we don't really know. Do you know what that calendar cycle and we are. students in FCT? Are at home now because Ex teachers have been on five days warning strike in the FCT. Yes, yes, yes. So, okay. Sorry, back to this work, work story. Let, let me take details from uh, page six of the paper. Uh, this is the uh, spokesperson for uh, the head. That's that's the. It's not the spokesperson. It's the head of the WIAC National Office, Patrick. Uh, Patrick uh, Arega. Uh, he said that the result was being released 45 days after the seven-week examination ended on October 8, uh, according to him, despite serious challenges the, country, the council faced in conducting and grading uh, the examination. The examination ended on October 8, and da 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 he, said the, he also said that the timetable for the 2022 examination will return to the normal May-June belt. There you are. So I, I saw an update inside the <coughs> things like on the e-Naira, e -Naira, um, Introduction of the e -Naira. It says a uh, CBN, uh, PSP's fintech partner on e -Naira adoption. It just, it's just. I, I, uh, haven't, I haven't read the story. Yes, that's you haven't. It's, it's I, I, just. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, just finally, uh, bio capital inflow crashes by eighty percent. Foreign investors shun Nigerian market. I don't know who is seeing this. Uh, just to find out from on page nineteen. Yeah, we uh, reviewed that yesterday. Oh, you did? Yes, we yeah. did that. We okay. reviewed that yesterday. Anyway. Okay. Yeah, I, I just, just a, a few things. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it may be useful uh, for purposes of, of, of clarification. The APC says the national convention will now take place in... Uh, February? In, in February. I, I'm wondering, is it the governors or the president that normally would fix the date for the convention? What, what is the uh, party organ? decides on the date for a convention and therefore conducts the convention. But there are conflicting reports I've been reading that the president has approved uh, the conduct of, of the convention in February next year. Another one says, oh, the state governors uh, met and then uh, proposed it to the president for the president to approve. State governors, of course, will be part of uh, the NEC. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't have access to the constitution now to immediately ascertain that because these are some of the governance issues that you find in political parties which is the proper organ of a party to announce the date for a convention mm. well uh, i think uh, you have left it to the authority of the president but apparently from the brief they gave yesterday there was indication that they said december is end of the year and it's not ideal for the convention January, there is an election in uh, AKT, I think they said, and because of that, that is why they proposed February. And that has been accepted by the president following the briefing they had with him. But the specific date will be worked out by the caretaker committee and whatever the party hierarchy for the specific date for the yeah, convention. Yeah, I, I understand. I'm just saying uh, that's the reason that they gave. Yes. For, but mm -hmm. who is the appropriate authority amongst the party organs? to decide on the date for the convention. The date can be 1st of February, it can be 28th of February. I'm just saying, who is the appropriate organ? Who is the appropriate organ? Because these are some of the issues that uh, purists, you know, would say, what is the pro who is the proper person 
to say this? Mm -hmm. Whom do you attribute it to? Well, Bayo, I think we'll leave that question as a rhetoric question. Mm. Yes, so that um, uh, those who the are. The APC will answer it. Thank you very much. So, Bayo, we'll see you tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Really, yes. This is Good Morning Nigeria live on the network service of the NTA. Uh, we're moving on. When we come back, we'll begin our conversation. Then go away. Ministry of Works and Housing uh, has the responsibility to help improve the quality and the quantity of the road infrastructure uh, assets, which are the roads and the bridges and the highways. At the moment, we have over 13,000 kilometers of road network under repair, reconstruction, or rehabilitation out of the existing 35,000 kilometers of federal road network. These 13,000 kilometers are comprising about 850 different contracts which the ministry superintends across Nigeria. We are fulfilling the mandate of our ministry to expand the connectivity of Nigeria's states and by extension the towns and villages through road transport. Hey there, what's on your bucket list? Would you like to travel the world, live your best life? What if I told you you could blow right this minute and do everything on that list? Atel is saying thank you to all loyal customers. You stand a chance to win up to 100 million Naira with guaranteed cash tokens in the Atel Recharge and Blow promo. How awesome is that? All you have to do is recharge to win. For more information, dial star 444 star 4 hash to enter for the draw. Everyone's a winner. So hurry now. The more you recharge, the more you win. Airtel, the smartphone network. One country, one peaceful people, united in diversity. We are great Nigerians. Let's be peaceful. We refuse to be manipulated by desperados and instigators. We cannot succeed without your cooperation. A peaceful and united Nigeria is possible. Join us in one voice, one love and unity. As we march around the 36 states of Nigeria, including the FCP, for national peace and unity campaign to tackle the peace. But when Taro Nigeria, Domain Dawood is where you as a economy in Nigeria. When the power of love overcomes the love for power. For our country, Nigeria. Together we stand. This message is brought to you by the Ambassadors of Voice of Change Initiative, supported by Nigerian Television Authority, NTA, and Federal Capital Territory, FCT. Welcome, man. If you've just joined in, you're watching Good Morning Nigeria on the network service of the NTA. Now, following security concerns in the southeast region, uh, key players have intensified efforts to ensure a lasting solution in the area uh, is found, at least, and encourage uh, socio-economic and political development. Of course, we know uh, just a, you know the, the visit of the uh, very influential uh, leaders from the southeast under the auspices of the great uh, Igbo greats who paid the president a visit in respect of this. But let's listen to this background report put together by Abdul Salam Chupri for starters. <laughs> The growing security challenges across the country has been a source of concern for many, particularly the leadership. From kidnappings to extremist insurgency, almost every region of the country has been hit by violence and crime. The Southeast especially has been a major source of worry. But it was not always so. Until recently, the region was arguably one of the most peaceful parts of the country. But now, it has evolved into a theater of violence targeting state security institutions and government officials by armed men popularly referred to as unknown gunmen. The sit-at-home order declared by non-state actors in the region has also contributed to the security challenge the region is currently facing. 
On Friday last week, President Muhammadu Buhari met with some traditional and religious leaders of the Igbo extraction. While the public was not privy to all that was discussed, some security experts maintained that their visit is not unconnected to the security challenge in the southeast zone. For now, it seems that the residents of the southeast are having some relief after the conduct of the Anambra governorship election. So what should be done to sustain the peace being enjoyed presently? What role should the state, local government, and other leaders play to sustain peace and stability in the region? The answers to these and more shortly. All right, joining us here at the studios uh, to discuss the issue, we'd like to welcome Paul Andrew Guaza. He's of uh, the Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution. Uh, Paul, pleasure to have you again on Good Morning Nigeria. Thank you for having me. Also here with us in the studios, we'd like to welcome Chief Great Imo Jonathan. He's a PR and media consultant. Uh, thank you. I, I don't like to be called a chief. Let's... Uh, my people will demand some things from me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, but, but you are a great man. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, all right. Um, let's also introduce uh, Dr. Ndebesi Mokolo. Uh, Dr. Ndebesi Mokolo is managing partner and uh, chief executive next year <coughs> security, peace and development. Uh, he also holds a PhD in international development, uh, focusing on state and peace building, conflict resolution, uh, and so on and so forth. It's good to have you, uh, Dr. Mokolo, with us. Thank you for having me. So here with us in the studio, we have Chris Aguri. He's the Flag Foundation uh, of Nigeria. You know him. Uh, whenever you see him, he has the green, white, green flag. Mr. Aguirre, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, Nigerians. Yes, Mr. Proudly Flag. Proudly Nigerian, yes. Proudly yes. Nigerian. <laughs> and from our Kanu studio, we are being joined by Dr. Sali Momale, Executive Vice Chairman, Kaduna State Peace Commission. Uh, we're glad to have you join us, uh, Dr. Momale. Thank you very much, and good morning, Nigerians. All right. All right, uh, gentlemen, once again, I'm delighted uh, to have you with us on, on this uh, program. Uh, incidentally, uh, some months ago, I'm sure we all recall, uh, at the height of uh, the destruction uh, and killings in the Southeast, uh, we had back-to-back -back editions of Good Morning Nigeria discussing the way forward uh, in seeking to pacify uh, the raw nerves uh, in, in the Southeast, uh, bring about peace, and then, of course, ultimately, uh, development. The Anambra elections uh, were threatened, of course, at the time. But uh, happily, some would say the elections have come and have gone. But significantly, last week, uh, preeminent Igbo leaders were at the presidential villa where they had a meeting with President Muhammad Buhari, widely reported in terms of uh, the outcome of that meeting. Uh, let's begin first with uh, Great Imo Jonathan. Great Imo Jonathan, what is your reading now of the Southeast against the background of what I've just said? Uh, well, um, I'm happy that uh, peace is gradually returning to the Southeast. Uh, uh, if, you, if you listen, in the last two weeks, uh, we've not been hearing much of what we used to hear before. And like I said the last time we were here on this program, I said, part of what is going on in the South is, is political. You notice that since after the Anambra election, our main non-government, non they have drastically reduced. We have other factors leading to insecurity in the Southeast. We had mentioned them severally, unemployment. We've discussed about drug. In fact, there is another menace going on in the Southeast now that has become an issue of concern. There's this particular destructive drug that have penetrated the communities of the Southeast. They call it Mpurumini or Metafei or whatever. A lot of young people are on this drug and once anybody is on that drug, he can do things you, or you can't imagine. 
So, and how these things have penetrated Southeast communities, no one can explain. So, whilst we're also looking at the political issues, we're looking at the agitations, we're also looking at, at cultism, we're also looking at issues of drug. Because such characters, in fact, there's a video going viral, a certain character who, after taking the drug, killed the sister and the mother. And eventually the community youth have to round him up and also kill him as well. So some of these characters are these people causing this mayhem. So you have to be able to identify these different facets of the crisis going on in the Southeast. And I must say that the visit of the Southeast leaders to Mr. President is a welcome development. It is actually, it should have happened like last year. When things are happening, we shouldn't keep quiet, we shouldn't wait until they degenerate. And not just visiting Mr. President. There is also the need for the Southeast leaders to continue to meet, to talk to themselves, because part of what has happened in the Southeast is there is vacuum of leadership. Yes, there is vacuum of leadership. Nobody has been speaking for the people. In fact, I was telling somebody, there used to be a group called, the in those days, Igbo State Union. Before you became a governor, before you became anything, it must be discussed at that level. Amongst the Igbo nation, in the Igbo nation, it was difficult for any charlatan to come out to say he want to be anything. But now we see people who, from nowhere, people with questionable characters, they will just wake up because they have money from God knows where they got it. They want to become governors. They want to become senators. They, are, they, they will arm young people to want to help them to install themselves by all means. And some of these crises were as a result of the failure of forcing themselves into governance in the Southeast. So over the years, the failure of Igbo leaders to governance their community to say, we know you. And if you don't, if, you, if we are sure you did not win the election, you cannot be governor, you cannot be senator, you cannot be counselor. Because when you are a product of the people, there is no way you can alienate the people. There is no way you cannot speak for them. There is no way you cannot stand up for them. But right now, we have people who are not product of the people. Even when things are going wrong in their community, they don't care. You will see community fights going on. Things are happening. Somebody is a member of the State House of Representatives representing that community. He never cares. A local government chairman. Some of these local government chairmen are in Abuja here. When the allocation comes, the governor hijacks it. If some of them getting around 50 million, what they get in actual fact may be 5 million to pay salaries, another 5 million for them and their boys, and that is all. Nothing happens at the local government, community health centers, and also there is also that failure of leadership. And the inability of this community leadership to hold the communities and the young people has led to this waywardness. Everybody doing what they like, and now it has snowballed into all of this. So it is on this point, that, or this, uh, based on this point, I would say that the visit is, is, is a welcome development, but it should not end there. They should go back home and sit amongst themselves, visit themselves, tell truth to themselves, and then from there, tell truth to also the nation. Because when he was feel marginalized, the young people who attempt to speak on behalf of Debo today, who we see as not qualified to do so, are doing so because these leaders have failed to speak. They have failed to speak when the roads are not built. They have failed to speak when the education sector is collapsed. They have failed to speak when the health institutions are collapsing. They have failed to speak when there is no road in the southeast. Because a lot of these leaders are also corrupt. Because they are corrupt. They are afraid to speak because when they come out to speak, somebody in Abuja will tell them, we have spent eight, we have given you federal location, whether state or local government, 803 billion in six years. And your state, you can't say anything you are doing with it. Because they know they are corrupt. These governors cannot come to Abuja and say, hey, Mr. President, I don't like what you're doing because of the fear of how they will be challenged for the corruption, of how they mismanage that that has been given to them on behalf of their people. And Great. when the silence goes on for too long, young people become agitated and begin to speak where elders can no longer speak. Great, thank you. Um, in fact, that was an explosive opener. Uh, we'll just... Uh, allow you to cool down, and then we'll come <laughs> back to you. But let's, let's bring Dr. Ndebesi Nwokolo. I'd I, I just like him to speak uh, to some of the issues that you've mentioned. The Southeast is really quiet. Uh, the, the, the fire is no longer burning. 
uh, but it has not totally been quenched because um, uh, the paper is reporting an incident somewhere in Awamama, you know, where uh, a soldier was killed. And uh, there's been re uh, reprisal, uh, you know, uh, 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 what would I say? Not, not attacks, you know, reprisal by uh, some security forces. So the, 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 the fire has not been quenched totally. Do you think that the visit of the Igbo Great will finally put out the fire in the Southeast? Okay, thank you. I think uh, most importantly, uh, it's good that we understand that no one conflict is the same and no one conflict is solved in the same manner. For me, um, the first thing as a country we should, we should start doing immediately is to start doing a matrix of all the conflict issues in the country and understanding how to deal with them. Um, it, will be, it will be bad for me to say that we can use one approach to solve all of them. But that of the Southeast is not really different from the other ones, but the solutions are not the same. However, what we, we've just seen is um, um, the conflict being in a cooler for a while. But it's good that we understand that being in a cooler does not mean that we've solved it. It's going to um, come up from um, within, within a period of time now. So my thinking first is that the, the Igbo leadership or the uh, Igbo great meeting the president, first, I think, is the right approach. Because um, if you look at the entire scenario that uh, over the last 12 months have seen the Southeast moving from almost the most peaceful state to a state where within the last, one mo last 12 months we had um, 148 violent incident, and it is much. Out of it, 58 came from Imo and about 30 from Anambra. So um, this, uh, for me, is much in terms of the killing and in terms of uh, the casualties that we experienced. Now, the issue here is that this, the Nigerian state, I, I want to uh, bring in the Nigerian state, there's a failure from the Nigerian state in understanding how to deal with it. It tried to deal with it the way it was dealing with other conflicts. Now, the question could be, what could it have done differently? Probably what it would have done differently was to listen. That a state listens to complaints from its citizens does not mean that the state is weak. The state is saying, yes, I'm listening, yes, I, I want to solve it which makes me a bit happy with what Mr. President said. He said, your request that I should release Nande Kano is a big one, but let me see what I will do. What I will do means he might decide to say, okay, even though this, is, this has become legal, but let's see if there's a political route out of it. Because it could be that what the Agitators in the South is wanted to know is that the state is listening. The state could have said, okay, because of the way the Igbo communities are constituted, Igbo community, like we all know, is different from the House of Lani community, the Yoruba community. Igbos are egalitarian and republican. The Igbo does not care that, you, you, that somebody is his chief. He will tell truth to power. So probably if the state had organized a town hall union, small, small units where people come and say, our agitation, our agitation is because the local government chairman have not been doing, doing this. Our agitation is that the governors have not been doing this. Our agitation is that the federal government have not been doing this. Maybe through organizations like the National Orientation Agency, the NTA and other civil society organizations and mass media, People are saying, okay, the federal government is not doing this, but this is the location we've given to your state over a period of time. If you link this to what uh, the great Imo was saying, you could see that issues of economy, youth unemployment, and so on and so forth can be tied to all these things. Yes, the same you can say about the Northwest, the Northeast, the South-South, 
But even though we know that youth unemployment and so on are part of what is blowing this conflict across the country, as well as the, the downward economic situation. However, the approach may not be the same. You might say that the Igbo, the conflict in the Southeast may not be more ideological like that, like that of the Northeast. However, it cannot remove issues of economy, issues of political exclusion, and all forms of exclusion that has been going on in the country. So now that we have a kind of what I would refer as negative peace, or a peace that is in the cooler, what should we be doing now? What I think we should be doing now is to move in straight away. We need to start talking to this youth organization. We need to start talking to this um, agitators. Mind you that IPOB is not the only agitating group in the Southeast. So whenever I hear people call IPOB, IPOB, it's not only IPOB. There are up to 10 of them. Even the issue of ongoing non-men or non-ongoing non men or, 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 or whatever they are referred to may not actually be people who are sympathetic to IPOB. Criminalities are running. That of Anambra before the election, it, it was assumed that a lot of people even supported it, thinking that it could have led to them winning an election. So a lot of things went into it. So what I think the state should be doing now, or the federal government should be supporting now, is first, supporting town hall union, supporting research and policy development and understanding of actually what the problem is. Because we, can be, we, we might here be, be thinking, OK, the problem is because the Igbos feel they are neglected. No, there is more to that. And for us to understand what are the other things we don't know. We need to commit time and effort to studying it, to talking to people, to engaging to the people. Then we can, we can understand it. Now, you, you find out that even before the, the, the violence, the killing that went on in the Southeast, there was a point in time you find out that the state security agents in the Southeast, a police officer will rather want you to post into the Southeast because of things around the place. You know, which um, I shouldn't be mentioning in the national television, but I know we understand that. A lot of Igbos felt they were being choked by the state, uh, uh, the state um, security institution. But it was actually a, a form of protection for them, even though they weren't directly paying for it. But these days, nobody wants to go there as a police officer because you don't want to be shot. Put all this in the context. You know that to deal with all this means that if you have a situation where we understand what the problem is, and to understand what the problem is, is to commit time and effort to that. And I think that's the, the right way to go, and that's the only way we can start solving this problem. If we think that because um, we, we have a three, three week school off, that it's going to go that way, no, it won't go that way. So once we start looking at it from uh, a political angle, which I think is important, knowing that Using a political means means that probably this is something we should have done two years ago. We didn't do that. But like Tuna Tebe will say, it's... Uh, Wonkolo, thank you very much there for your opening shot. We will, of course, uh, return to you. We have five uh, guests uh, on this topic this morning. Three of, uh, of course, uh, four of you are here in Abuja. And uh, we have another guest from our Kano Network uh, Center. Let's bring in now uh, Paul Andrew Guaza of the Institute for Peace and, and Conflict Resolution. A against the backdrop of what we have seen in the past two, three weeks, uh, what, what's your assessment? Uh, are we taking the tentative steps towards rapprochement in the Southeast? Yeah, thank you uh, for seeking my opinion on this, but I think I'm not going uh, any way different from what the earlier speakers have said. Uh, just to re-echo the fact that what we have seen uh, in last week or so, uh, especially the engagement that the president had with the uh, great Igbo group, led by uh, His Excellency Amechi, Elder Amechi, is indeed an, uh, a very major step that for any peacemaker, whether local or international, is an opportunity that we need to grab. 
Importantly because um, he has made commitment on behalf of the Igbos that if the suggestion they are providing is followed by the state, they are ready to commit to the fact that this young man that is the head of the agitation will not this time around run away, but uh, that it will be uh, the door for lasting peace in the region. And I think it's a good one. Uh, for, and that is what we have, been, we have not been doing in the previous engagement, to, uh, uh, to be able to engage these uh, agitators, and like what Dr. Mokolo has said. But for me, again, is to bring back the idea, the concept of self-determination itself within the context of uh, federalism. Because self-determination may not necessarily be succession, but it could be that you can explore the possibility of determining your future as a group within the context of federalism. And again, it has been hyped over and over again, whether in the media uh, or in policy discussion, to say that can we make this federalism as we have in our constitution workable? It's not about true federalism. It's about the workability of even the instruments that we have committed to ourselves. And I think that is uh, one way we can, we can follow, especially the, that these Igbo leaders, uh, the important thing just to pause a bit, is that conflicts always affords you the opportunity to explore, uh, to understand yourselves. So I think, uh, I think it was William Zadman that talked about the ripeness of the conflict then, ripe in the sense that it is now ready for uh, peace to come up. And I think the Southeast leaders, have understand that this conflict is ripe to be, uh, to be resolved. And I think that all of us in the studio and those joining us outside have agreed that this conflict in the South is, is not to anybody's benefit. Uh, so I think that the state can now galvanize social capital that the uh, great Igbos are, are now offering, willingly so, to say that then we will be able to do what the suggestions that Dr. Okolo is suggesting. Can we then strengthen through the, I mean, the resources that the state is providing, strengthen existing social structures within the communities to, ins to ensure that they are workable? Talking about whether unemployment, whether, <coughs> indeed I was, uh, I think two weeks ago, or they are about, I was in Olu area, and you saw the deplorable, I mean, you can see the deplorable nature of the road from Owere to Olu. And to say that three governors uh, are from that part of the state is indeed not uh, a good commentary for that state. But again, the point is that we must ensure that we explore this uh, uh, social capital and to ensure that this uh, federalism is, it affords us the opportunity for these agitations. The agitation is for self-determination. And across the country, there is this agitation for self-determination. But we can, we can make our uh, federalism to work in the sense that every component of the society is meant to function and to function effectively. Okay. And, and this visit by the great Igbo leaders affords us that opportunity. I think that is the rider to what we have been discussing uh, in the previous edition of this program. Okay. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Gwaza, for your opening remarks as well. Uh, let's bring in the, uh, Mr. Flag, Chris Aguirre. Uh, Chris, uh, Dr. Mokolo has uh, described the situation in the Southeast at the moment as uneasy, if, if, if I just paraphrase what he said, uneasy um, calm in the area and that um, one should not expect uh, the calmness that pervades the area at the moment, you know, to, to, to be sustained, you know. But given the visit of the Igbo Great to the president, um, what are your thoughts? What value do you think that will bring to the much um, sought after intervention of the, you know, influential or uh, prominent Igbo leaders? Yeah, thank you very much. Well, all said and done, peace, as we're experiencing it in the Southeast today, should be sustained by every means possible. We, for no reason, should we lower our gas any longer, you know, towards sustaining what we have on ground. Uh, after the, before the Anambra election, we were all here. We went to Anambra, I was there. 
And um, to the glory of God, it came out and ended the way it did. We must, by every means, it's a challenge on us individually and collectively as in the Igbo. It is a challenge for the Federal Republic of Nigeria to use every possible and uh, legal means to sustain the peace, beginning with the people. Who are the victims of the crisis in the East? It's the Southeasterners. They are the number one victims. It behoves on them. The political leadership duly constituted and recognized political leadership in the East to tell themselves the bitter truth. The Southeasterners at home and diaspora must tell ourselves the truth that look, we must not allow, we must not allow what has been going on to continue. They should, how do we do that? The average Igbo man is to a large extent helpless. Those that control political institutions and hold power and the size, power and authority, it's like controls everything. And they are so disconnected, <coughs> are so disconnected from the people. The gap between the political leadership in the Southeast and the people, the citizens, is so wide. The people don't know what is going on with government. Government does its own things. They just watch it on the television, on the social media, rumor and all that. You know, I, do, I don't want to interrupt you, but I, I'm compelled to do so because <laughs> I, I, I really wanted you to evaluate the, the value, you know, the, the, the benefit or advantage of the visit of the Igbo leaders. Okay. Yes, I, I, okay. B because there have been a lot of agitation for, you know, prominent Igbo leaders to intervene, to come out and um, play their parts. And, and there was a lot of, um, there's been a lot of confidence, you know, building on them. Now that they've come out, now that they've gone to the president and they've made, you know, their desires, what they want known to the president, the president has also, you know, given them an answer. What do you think, what value do you think it will have in restoring peace in the Southeast? Well, uh, the old man said something, that the president should go down, should consider himself as one that will go down in history, that there was crisis, I was fire in the country, and he's the one that quenched the fire. And that is one of the best legacies President Buhari will leave for himself, for posterity to record him. Going forward, political solutions to the issues are there. The economic solutions is also another step. The issue of inclusion. One, we talk about infrastructure, there are no roads in the Southeast. It's not necessarily the responsibility of federal government to build roads. The political leadership in the South East must wake up to that responsibility. Secondly, the issue of inclusion. Because I find it you know, difficult to understand when you are discussing the security in the South East or the national security generally. In the federal uh, national security council, there's no Igbo man there. Me, as a carrier, of the Nigerian national flag, I find it difficult. How would you discuss their own security without any of them making reasonable input? That's the issue of why there should be an inclusiveness, because it's an existential challenge. Then thirdly, which borders on Igbo political leadership to cash on on what the old man's visit is and then governize the entire people including the IPOB leaders. For me, I advise them, whosoever, they should stop attacking soldiers because it's not about what happened at Adel Mama now. It's linked to attacking a soldier or killing a soldier. That soldier may have been killed by, by criminals, but then, but the nature of, of the military, once one of them is harmed, if they've not avenged for it, their spirit will not be at peace. It brings to another thing to that. The soldiers, the security men you deploy to the service, there should be another form of proper orientation. Yes, there have been killing of uh, security personnel in the southeast, so anyone going there is already agitated because there's no other life. Once you are, you are taken, you are taken. 
Hmm. You know, Chris, thank you. I, w I want to just keep you on hold too because uh, we're, we're, we're already running our time. Let's uh, also hear from Dr. Saleh Momali, uh, who is the Executive Vice Chairman of the uh, Kaduna State Peace Commission. Um, Dr. Momali, I'd just like for you to talk to us because um, uh, a lot of people have come up with suggestions on how to address, you know, crises of the asymmetrical type. Uh, they say, okay, this is not uh, a conventional warfare uh, going on in, in different parts of the country, but particularly to the southeast now. Uh, it's not asymmetrical per se. Uh, I think it's Dr. Okulo's outfit next year that captured it as urban uh, guerrilla tactics. You know? So from your perspective, military might and force has been ruled out. Can you give us, you know, uh, appropriate measure that uh, can be engaged to resolve uh, the crisis or can, you know, be used to ensure sustainable peace in the region? Okay, good morning, Nigerians, and thank you very much. I first start expressing my appreciation to the NTA for bringing this topical issue and bringing in experts and people who will make meaningful contribution in finding uh, ways of addressing this. I urge many of our media organizations to continue to do this because citizens engagement and passing on of the ac accurate and appropriate information to citizens is one of the surest ways of addressing many of these challenges that we are facing today because it creates the right understanding and enable people to diagnose the issues more correctly and to respond more appropriately. Um, coming back to the visitation to Mr. President and the engagement that has taken, I think it, like my earlier colleague said, is long overdue and it is most welcome and we hope it will open up opportunities for further engagements and speaking to stakeholders within the Southeast in particular, but also other stakeholders that can come in and support wherever they are, within and outside the country. Um, the visit by the leaders from the Southeast has demonstrated clearly one thing, because one of the drivers of secessionist uh, agitations always is power struggle. Uh, over by huge or big political leaders or political actors uh, usually wanting to break up because they have not access political power. What is evident from this is that the issue of association in the Southeast is not an issue of political power or scramble for political leadership. Uh, so that has ruled that out and that is very important to us. Then the second aspect that normally drives agitation is perceptions or real marginalization that is always uh, driven by some draconian policies or programs or laws that is met against certain people or who are exclusively marginalized from the economic or governance affairs of any part of the nation. Now, if we look at the Southeast and Nigeria as a whole, we all know that it is very difficult for anybody to justify that the Indigo as a people in this country are marginalized or excluded, apart from maybe just narrow uh, political positions that we could speak about. But if you look at education, the Southeast is one of the most educated regions in this country. If you look at it in terms of economic opportunities, in terms of diversity, in terms of reaching out to the whole country, enterprising, they are among the most enterprising group of Nigerians. So this has given them huge opportunities and they are making meaningful contribution to Nigeria's development and progress. And you find that all over the country, you really see any exclusionary policies or practices in any part of the country that is trying to isolate one particular ethnic group or one particular socio-economic group from the general spheres of the economy, the development of the country. Now, coming back to, to the issues, then why is this agitations? We can clearly see that it is of two components. One, there is real issue about youths restiveness that is common in all parts of the country, driven by weak economy, lack of adequate economic opportunities. And so these young people are inadequately mobilized and they are ready to listen to anybody who engages them. Then secondly, is the weakness generally within the polity 
of engaging citizens. You can see that clearly from what all the other speakers have said. We are inadequately engaging our citizens, particularly our young people. Whenever problems or crises are emanating with the political leaders at all levels, from the community leaders in the villages to the traditional institutions to the local governments, the state governments and the federal government, I'm happy the Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution are here and they will justify that. We neglect all engaging our citizens and creating the right, the right awareness. For this reason, most young people today have no shared national ideals. We have no shared national goals. We have no shared aspirations for the country as a whole. And so everybody goes back to his local environment and try to find sanctuary, sanctuary in the face of uh, a deprived economy, in the face of you know, weak infrastructure and many other challenges. So, and, uh, and then this restiveness again is a major driver of criminality. So many criminal groups have capitalized on these and are committing heinous crimes, either in the name of religion, in the name of ethnicity, in the name of agitation, in the name of militancy, or any whatever platform. And whereas the real purpose for them is to commit crime. So my suggestions for the ways forward is that first of all, let's carry out a thorough analysis of the challenges in the Southeast. Let's distinguish between citizens' agitation the activities of criminal groups, the need for economic empowerment, the need for youth engagement, the need to engage and enlighten the citizens and have a common goal for the Southeast and for the nation. Let's say that this is one sure issue that we must understand and work out mechanisms for dealing with that. The second issue is that of agitation. Most of these issues about agitation, in my understanding, is driven because we are not adequately engaging our citizens. Let us uh, inform the general youth in the Southeast that the challenges they are facing are not different from the challenges youth in every other part of Nigeria are facing. That these common problems we are facing, we need to not approach them from a violent perspective, but from a peace uh, perspective, agitating and engaging our leaders and then holding leaders accountable to make sure that we have the right and enabling policies and framework to carry out our own means of livelihood and improve our social and economic well-being. Then the other issue with respect to criminality is really a very tough one because the capacity of the Nigerian state to use the instruments of coercion to use the instruments of law to deal with criminal activities in all parts of the country has proven very weak. And therefore, we as citizens, as leaders everywhere, like I always say, let's stop the blame game. Let's come and sit down collectively. Let's review our security architecture and see how do we do to restore our various communities to the path of uh, secured communities and ensure the security and safety of lives and properties. Finally, I will, I, at, this, uh, at this point, I will say that peace is really not easy, and peace cannot be achieved by chance. And I think Nigeria, for a very long time, have left peace to chance. And this explains some of the reasons we are having all these challenges in all parts of the country. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Saleh Mamale, there for your insight. Now back to our Abuja studios. Uh, earlier, Undubusi Nwokolo was referencing some aspects of Igbo social anthropology. And uh, great Igbo Jonathan himself had also talked about the various mechanisms that could be activated in Igbo land uh, to ensure that there is sufficient interrogation of the issues and development of strategies for sustainable peace. I, I, was, just, I was just wondering, uh, before we get into this, can we probably climb a couple of steps up? And my question is going to Paul, uh, Andrew Guaza. <clears throat> How much of art or science is deployed in peace management in Nigeria? 
Because if you say, look, do you understand the social anthropology of a people? Do you understand their cultural nuances? Do you understand their decision-making processes? Uh, rather than say, most things kinetic, most things kinetic, or you go through the wrong persons. Do, how, how much, how much of, of that interrogation do we normally undertake before saying, okay, you are going to the Southeast, operation whatever, or operation this, or operation that? The, the reality of the matter is that, uh, and I think that the, this, gov this administration uh, intended to start on a good footing. <clears throat> Remember the inaugural speech of the president in 2015, uh, with respect to the South, I mean, not East, he said that uh, the first thing he will do was to undertake a social, a logical analysis of the uh, conflict in uh, uh, North East as at then. Uh, even though little or much has been done. I know also that uh, the UN has done quite a lot of study on that. Uh, the then Presidential Committee on North East had done quite a lot of analysis on that. Now back to the South East. Uh, the, the, with respect to <coughs> the question you raised, I know that there are huge documents, both from the universities and even in my office, and I know that Wakolo and others also have done a lot of things. Last year, we did analysis of the core conflicts in the country with, uh, with uh, I think Wakolo was there with Friedrich Eber Staten. And I know that the separatist agitation was part of the core conflict that was analyzed last year. But uh, I think your point of uh, concern is to look at the anthropology, what, what has been working in those days, that is not working now. In terms of, for instance, I know that the last conversation, we did talk about the Omoada or something like that. And I saw uh, the two weeks visit I had in uh, Olu uh, area of uh, Imo State. I saw that coming to fore, actually, their, their critical role in determining even how to be buried, how ceremonies are to be conducted, who is to say what at, at one point. Uh, you know, so they are so powerful, even though they have gone out to marry elsewhere, but they determine the, so, the social discussion within their communities of birth. Uh, so I, I know that there are a lot of studies on that. Uh, there, there is this professor of um, history in University of Jaws that did quite a lot of study on, on, on the nature of, I mean, war and peace in Igbo land and brought that to the fore. Uh, we have done on an annual basis in the institute uh, analysis or what we call the strategic conflict analysis of the country and it is actually on a zonal basis. The Southeast report is there. Uh, last year also we did quite a lot of things. But I know one thing, sir, is, is riding on what uh, Dr. Nwokolo said. It is another thing to do this study. It is quite different thing to deliberately design policy to be able to design programming. Because the policy analysis will then tease out what are the program intervention that will come out of this particular intervention. Uh, that has been going on anyway. But the problem is what uh, my, my brother with the Flag Nigeria, I mean Flag Foundation said. The problem is the disconnect. In terms, and my, one of my friends said, the act is in the governance. You do this analysis, you bring out the policy analysis, and indeed it is out the programming. But the problem, the problem is that how has the governance been able to implement these policies and programming? Right? So it is for the governance, I mean for the government to begin to look deeper, to say that even before we design budgets, the annual budgets that has become an a, 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 a annual ritual. Do we engage these communities? And you remember one of the things that we always cite is the Ife Mode KK crisis that was a product of government decision to create local government. Have we been sensitive to this community? If the communities are not carried out, I mean carried on in terms of the conception and the implementation of every project and program. And indeed you begin to look at if we're citing uh, breach in community A. Why are we not citing in community B? That is a critical component of this engagement. Because that will then 
make us to begin to bring all the leaders because it's, imp it's important in the, south, in the Southeast that all the leaders are part of even the budget uh, design and implementation. That is not going on right now. Because uh, even though under one of the governors in, the, in, in Imo State, we used to see it on the television that you bring all the traditional ru rulers in, 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 in budget design and programming design and implementation, but you, you don't see it going on in terms of design, in terms of implementation and monitoring and reporting. I think that that is the, the, the gap that we need to begin to do, I mean begin to feel. And I think the visit with, by, the, uh, by the great Igbo leaders and the president, the state then need to begin to engage them. If the state, for instance, the federal government is thinking of sharing, uh, giving them bail out, they should be able to follow the money, like uh, international, I mean, transparency. Follow the money to begin to know, is this money impacting on the people? And I think it's very, very critical for our government. Thank mm. you, sir. You know, Mr. Gwaza, you, you talked <coughs> about an important issue that, you know, reminded me of the role played by women, you know, in the 1929 uh, Abba riots. Uh, of course, we all know the Abba women riot, how, you know, the governor came together and ended that um, uh, very, very, uh, you know, the uh, unfavorable tax regime in, in that area. And we could also um, leverage the sociocultural Umada groups. Mm -hmm. And the president himself said it this morning, it was, it's written on the front page of the papers, that women do better, you know, in peace uh, mission processes. And this is an area, this is a gap that, you know, we have not yet, you know, exploited in our peace missions. Mm -hmm. But we will look at that. We'll look at how important it is to involve the Umwada in the quest for peace in the Southeast when we come back. That is the black swan of the century has actually hit the whole world very hard, even the strongest of economies. And Nigeria was not spared. But due to the proactive stance and steps that the president has taken, we've been able to come out quickly. The president has consistently said we must invest in infrastructure. Even as we're investing in human capital, that we must invest in infrastructure. Because at the end of the day, that is what will bring about a sustainable economic growth. So the president has uh, given us our directive. He has said you must make sure you pay salaries and pay pensions but you also make sure that the critical projects of roads, railway, airports, bridges, major infrastructure that are meant to drive the growth of the economy, that we consistently invest in them, even if we have to continue to borrow to do so. This message is from the Federal Minister of Information and Culture. Finally, the hero of Nigeria's democracy has arrived. He shall usher us into a new phase of development, peace, and prosperity. He is the father of the new Nigeria. His Excellency, President Muhammadu Buhari, GCFR. Welcome to another season of Giving Nigerians Hope yet again. We are sure of a great future for both ourselves and generations yet unborn. We look forward to your leading us as a nation into our manifest destiny. Though the challenges against us as a people are many, we know that your leadership shall set us on the right path to our greatness. A new dawn beckons on us all and having you as our president is a precursor to this. Thank you for believing in Nigeria. This message is from the Nigerian Television Authority, NTA. We are all Nigerians. Against all odds, we shall and must remain united. We may have our challenges, our problems and setbacks. However, together we shall overcome them all. What doesn't break us shall make us stronger. This is the mindset that shall bring peace, progress and prosperity to our beloved country. Do not let tribal and religious sentiments govern how you think, act or feel. Don't be influenced by those who want to destroy our precious national unity. Everybody who is a Nigerian is your brother and your sister. This is the mindset of the new Nigerian.
Nigeria. It is also the mindset that we must all adopt. Let us support each other in creating the Nigeria of our dreams. This message is from the Nigerian Television Authority, NTA. You are welcome back. It is still Good Morning Nigeria live on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. We still have all our five guests uh, exploring, of course, uh, how to achieve sustainable peace in the southeast region. A number of perspectives have come up if you've uh, been with us since the commencement of, of the conversation. Let's uh, continue to drill into the issues that have been raised. I was just wondering, uh, great Imo Jonathan, you know, linking back again to... Uh, the action points that you had earlier articulated, uh, what needs to be done. Now, uh, Guaza is giving us the benefit of, of, of the existence of a number of studies. So nobody needs to reinvent the wheel and say this is what, what we are going to do. But how can we kickstart the process, say, in the Southeast? The process of accountability, process of engagement by the preeminent leaders, by other significant uh, influence us in, in the southeast. Okay. Well, what had happened is that uh, when when uh, he was giving his analysis, he made reference to uh, you know uh, the social structures that the Igbos were used to, and the things that have changed. Some of these structures were also victims of uh, colonization. When the British came here, they tried to impose themselves and their own institutions and structures and even led to conflict with the Igbos as of then. Mm -hmm. If you go and check the history, there's the, go and read about the Ekumeku War. Yes. 34 years of war and conflict between the Igbos and the British. It was a kind of uh, sectarian violence. It was not a, a full-blown war. And it continued until the Arrow Treaty of 1902. And just in less than 25 years, that peace broke down when you had about women riots. Because even when the British were coming, they didn't know how strong the women folks were within the Igbo social cultural in uh, this in political structure. They are das and the umunna and, and all of those things. There was never an absolute monarchy in Igbo land. Everybody had to be consulted before any decisions are taken. That is also in trying to solve this problem, there are also times where federal government institutions and structures have been part of the, this generating crisis in the East, you come to do election. Sincerely, we have had cases where INEC, which is a federal institution, police, army, knowing that this would not vote for this person, you, you supported him to become governor. And it's, it's an obvious case, you know that, simply because he has federal might. So we got to a point where people in the East will begin to talk about federal might. These are things they really don't like. Because Igbos like to make their own decisions. Igbos have been fiercely, they are fiercely competitive and bold and courageous people. So in dealing with them, like you talked about this study, so going back to it now, what we need to do is to accept that, okay, this is why a bit different from other parts of Nigeria. And this being a federation, we must, like you said, find a way to allow how these people exist within their own structure and environment to flow into interface with our it. politics. That was where, when we had regional government, where uh, regions had even ambassadors, high commissioners, had their own ministers who can go out, look for investment. Nigeria made the greatest progress because it allows for these cultural reflexes to get interface with politics. You understand? But now, everybody wants to grow literally at the same uh, pace. We want everything to be the same. And it cannot be in a multi-ethnic in a multicultural society like ours. So first and foremost, that is why to bring peace in the Southeast to start with, it is actually the Igbos that have to design the roadmap to peace. The Igbos have to be listened to. And also let me use this opportunity to debunk what uh, Dr. Yayane said when he talked about majority. Well, well, I said because if we want to have peace in Nigeria, truth must be particularly must be, must be the first step. We must be ready to hear the truth. We must be ready to tell ourselves the truth. He both feel marginalized, and rightly so in Nigeria. After the war, their environment was devastated. The 20 pound issues, the reconstruction, the three arrows were never implemented. Then you have gone from there to other issues, including cut off mark issues in schools. That those things are not issues you want to discuss or hear, but people have to grow as grow them and accept them as reality. But even up to now, you talked about even when state creations were done, 
Some part of Igbo societies we are given to other states, people where they become minorities in order because so we after the war we began to see ourselves as we against them. So that mentality must go. Yes. Truth must be spoken to each other in trying to solve the problem. Let the Igbos allow the Igbos to vent themselves peacefully by telling you what their anger is. How you interface with their, uh, interfere with their own environment and what they do. You talk about going to Southeast today, you are going from Lagos, custom will clear you, immigration will clear you from the, airport, uh, from the port. But before you get to Southeast, you must have pa passed almost 50 checkpoints. It's only, it only happens on your route to the Southeast. And these people are people who are fiercely independent minded people. They see all these things as oppression. And when those who are supposed to speak cannot speak, those who are literally called non state actors, who feel that because nobody, nobody is speaking, begins to find a way to vent this anger. So let the Igbos themselves decide to you know on how they want to solve this problem. That is the first and foremost. Let Nigerians allow Igbos to decide. Go and tell us. How do you think that there can be peace? Apart from other peripheral issues that has to do with politics, but let them come with implementable master plan to having peace in the southeast. It is only those that can bring peace in the environment. Even if you read those Ekumeku War and all that treaties that they have with Britain, you find out until Britain understood how this will reason. They never had solution. You read about Igbo land in the U.S. Igbo people are fiercely competitive and they hate oppression. It is in our nature. Let me put it that way. That is why if Anna, even the, the structure of Igbo communities, there must be the kindred, the distant, all decisions are made. Even those days, we don't have kings. What we had was a priest who was more like a king. So much of what he does was to consult the oracle. So understanding this thing will make you understand that it was only divinity, it was only divine power that could make Igbo man think differently. If you want to oppress him, you want to, you could only use that measure which was why the Arab got involved in becoming the, the evangelists of the old, setting up structures, shrines for different communities because they were operating from that angle. And that was why at that time, even when the Britain came, they thought Arab was the, the, the power base of Igbo land because Arabs were the evangelists who went from community to community, setting up these shrines for the Igbo people. But the Britain missed it. When they signed the treaty, they still discovered that the political hold was not there. So understanding how we reason, will be the first act. And the telling the truth, it will be the, also the major point of it. Let's, not, let's stop lying to ourselves. Mm. When we want to discuss truth and peace, we have to be very, very truthful to ourselves. Uh, that uh, would great, be important. Uh, yeah, uh, great, thanks. Uh, uh, Claire, mm. I, I would like Dr. Mokolo exactly, to also to... Uh, chip in here. Uh, of course, great has raised a number of points. Please piggyback on that, along with what we said, that uh, the Igbos Who will the have to design mm their own uh, design, framework. as it were, their own framework for sustainable peace uh, in the country. Not to design it to be outside of the country, mm -hmm. outside of Nigeria, but as uh, part of the measures for more efficient and effective interface. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I won't want to say much about what Great Imo have said, but I think uh, he has been able to establish that peace building has structures and substructures. And it's important that we understand that truth-telling is one of them. Healing is part of them. Understanding people's perception is another. So on and so forth. So I won't want to go into that. But, but what I think is that for, for most of these things, to, for us to start solving the, most of this problem, the people have to be at the forefront. They, they have to own it. Um, like let M.A. Abiola would say, you cannot shave my hair in my absence. So it's important that the Igbos are part of the drivers of sustainable peace in the Southeast. Like I always tell people, peace is like marriage. Once romance is not there, it will not work. After a while, it will die. It will, you would think it's working, but without romance being there, it will die. Now, I remember that in marriage, they will always tell you that communication is important. I, th I think it's one of the essentials that, have, that was missing and has been continued not to be in existence in Nigeria in the way we do peace building here. I'm happy he talked about the civil war, the three hours, and all that. Um, it would be a denial of for Nigerian state to continue to live in denial, to say that the Igbos do not think they are marginalized, whether it's real or a wrong perception. But dealing with it, talking about it, helps the healing. 
And I think there was some, a point he made, which is when uh, those who are in political governance refuse to talk, it gives room for those with so, some what may be an alternative truth or half truth to cash in on it, promote another narrative which will they will sell on easily to people who may not understand it. So it's important that we know that this might be a way to begin. So for me, it is important that we, we take the history of Igbo and the structures of Igbo. Most importantly, not to think that because somebody is a governor of a state, he makes all the laws and it works. The Igbos are not wired that way. And I think that is a mistake we are making. So to be able to deal with this, it's equally important for us to understand that there, that there was an article my organization wrote, which is about the town unions in, the, in, in all Igbo communities. As I talk to you now, even while, while I was studying in the UK, I was paying my, my community dues. They didn't know me, but my father had to pay it. Now I live in Abuja. I still pay it. So, and that is where the Igbos are structured. Now, if you go to most Igbo communities, because of the, the role the market plays, you find out that those small, small markets, aka for Ori and Kwa, the markets in the communities are another rallying point in all Igbo communities. Take the town union, take the market unions, you find out that you easily will start dealing with these things. Now, bringing the issue of Umada, all these small, small unit structures and Igbo communities are the people to start engaging. Why I think they are important is this. As, an, as, a, as a Wada, you are equally, you're an ambassador to, to the family you're married to, and then you're a minister and a governor in your own fa father's house. So if your son is behaving in a way that is outside the values of the community, you're able to deal with it. You're able to say, my son, you're, you're not doing well. If your brother is not behaving well, as one that you're going there to try to say something. The same thing with the pre today, the, what we call the president of these town unions, you know, the local leaders and so on. So for us to start dealing with this, organizations like uh, Institute for Peace and Community and um, Institute for Peace, as well as other development partners and organizations like ours, we can start working with government to tease out how these things can work. Because the, 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 the devil is in the detail. Being able to work with the state government, because the issue is that, let's be honest, most of these state governments do not even know what to do. They are almost like as powerless as ever. Because they've not done what they've done, they've lost acceptability, They've lost trust on these people. The trust deficiency is there. So for us to work with, to start dealing with these things, it's important that other organizations can partner with these Igbo units, start engaging them, town unions, market association meetings, and so on. That is the way to start breaking this, this, uh, this sentimental wars that has been created. And that is the way sustainable peace can start returning to the Southeast. Oh, okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wokolo. I, I mean, this, as I said, the more we drill uh, into this issue, the more interesting it gets. The, you have the historical perspective, the uh, cultural and anthropological uh, perspective. Uh, we just have to uh, understand uh, one another and then how to deal with ourselves. Uh, Dr. Saleh Momale, Dr. Saleh Momale, you know, listening to the comments that have been made, how to more effectively utilize our known uh, cultural nuances. What's, what is your take on this? And how much of this, for instance, has been your experience uh, in the Kaduna uh, Peace uh, Commission? Okay. Uh, thank you very much once again. I subscribe to many of the opinions that have already been expressed and there is no second way to citizens engagement there is no second way to people involvement there is no second way to working with community institutions and community leadership in dealing with any issue of insecurity and threat to peace and stability 
There is no second way to engage in people in terms of organizing and planning for development and how to organize their communities and societies for progressive, uh, to, to achieve progress in the economy, in education, in healthcare delivery. All these require active participation of stakeholders. But like we all said in this, commitment in engaging the citizens have been very, very low and has been inadequate. Secondly, I think there are a lot of perceptions which information, data, and analysis will debunk. And many of these perceptions, not only in the Southeast, in many other parts of Nigeria, in Kaduna State, in anywhere, we have been dealing with these perceptions every day. And many of these perceptions are reinforced, again, by political leaders, by some actors who are capitalizing on some of these divisive and some of these sentiments to cash in to common popularity. Because these are the major narratives, and anybody who comes with a counter-narrative is immediately castigated and is shown as a person who is not committed or who, is, who, who does not share the aspiration of his people or of his citizens or an outcast or some of the things like that. So, and, and I subscribe and I still stand on my position that as far as Nigeria is concerned, there are no known policies, there are no known economic uh, activities, there are no, no non-educational disparities that have excluded any part of Nigeria from the broader framework of the country. And we have not seen that. The only thing is that possibly in terms of uh, social, economic, and other developmental interventions, yes, there may be variations here and there. But as far as Nigerian government and governance structures and functions are concerned, there is no way we have seen in terms of citizens' ability to be in any other part of the country and to pursue their lawful means of livelihood. I have not seen and there are no substantial evidence of any form of discrimination uh, of any other particular group. So these are perceptions and engaging the citizens and engaging in dialogue and presenting evidence and facts will certainly debunk many of these claims and many of these issues. Just to say to that. And for the federal government, I think they have a huge responsibility. When they, uh, Mr. Gwaza from the Institute speaks about government, I think there is no any other government, in this case at the federal level, that is more strategic than the Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution. So you are at the center stage, and we expect the Institute to take the leading role in galvanizing all the federal institutions and all the federal stakeholders to move massively, not only in the South East, but in any other, all other parts of Nigeria that have security challenges. Again, at the state level, we have to see, like we have done in Kaduna State, not in the challenges, and also in Plateau State, we have peace building agencies that commits with real professionals and experts that commits their time and resources into social engineering and engaging the citizens to diagnose every challenge and every issue as it arises and try to find community-based acceptable mechanisms of dealing with this. And I urge all the states of the Southeast to try to explore this type of mechanism in order to engage their citizens. I also agree that the Indigo, the Igbo as a whole, have to lead this process, but they can capitalize and benefit from the broad experience, not only within the country, but internationally. And there are a lot of national and international stakeholders that are willing and will be able to support us in this process because experiences matters a lot and that. Then one other critical and important issue is the Igbo diaspora. They have a very, one of the most strongest diasporas in this country. And I think if there is need to engage the diaspora, there is need to... Yes, Dr. Dr. Mamale, that's a very important point you have also brought up. I would like to thank you. Uh, just a final one from uh, Mr. Chris Aguirre. I'm wondering if all said and done is implemented. Uh, some have said what another step, important step in uh, ensuring sustainable peace is to militarize the public space. Because if you don't do that, if government, I want to use the word, you know, uh, one of the um, uh, organizations use. If the Nigerian state does not take monopoly of the instrument of cohesion, that it will still get into the hands of those criminal elements, and then we're back to square one. So how important is it to demilitarize the space in the Southeast? 
Chris. Yeah, well, thank you. Most of the issues raised are fundamental, they're also long term you know, measures. Going forward, because there's no standing still, is that um, you're talking about an issue of uh, militarization or demilitarization. The Nigerian state, as a sovereign entity, cannot afford to fool its arms, and the state will fall. Actions and inactions of government may have influenced some, some uh, reactions. Activities of certain individuals or groups that have contributed to what we have now. And so, whatever group you belong to, whosoever you are, any action you are taking towards the Nigerian state as a sovereign entity, follow the rule of law, the lay down procedures. If you go outside that, you are looking for trouble. The state, as the octopus, the, the federal government, uh, must also look at is the, is the father of all. When your children are crying, look into what is their problem and be able to provide a solution <coughs> on how to uh, you know, maintain peace. Across the country, it's not peculiar to Southeast. Why is there a crisis all over the country? Why is there a crisis? It's possible that what is fueling what started in the northeast, now you know, uh, uh, northwest, north central, down southeast, it could be, it could be emanating from one source. It could be a standard. Mm. People who are interested in destabilizing Nigeria for whatsoever reason, they want to stabilize, destabilize Nigeria. Mm. So, but then as a people, as a government, we should not allow the Nigerian state, southeast in particular, to fall into the hands of you know, non-state actors to detect what goes on and how it goes on, then that is the failure of the state. Thank you, Chris. Uh, finally, great. Uh, you know, how important is it to demilitarize, you know, mop up uh, the guns? Well, yeah, I think he should know better. Once you, especially when you are dealing with issues of terrorism, they will tell you based on the international agency's uh, record, once the military involvement is above 80%, it's also a sign of failure. The fundamental to solving this problem is number one, that you must engage the citizens to be partners in, in actually securing the space. Where the security agents must play much more role is on, on governed spaces. You understand? Me? And also, in all of this effort to resolve this, you keep seeing these men in Agbada gathering transcorp, the same group of people, and each time they gather, you will list, you will not see or hear. This segment of people that you are trying to find solution for, the youths are alienated across board whenever peace is being discussed, being where they should be critical, they should play critical role in trying to resolve this thing. All right. Great. Emo Jonathan, PR Media Consultant. Deep thanks for being our guest this morning. Paul Andrew Guaza of the Institute for Peace and uh, Conflict Resolution here in Abuja. We appreciate you being around. Thank you very much. Chris Aguri, Flag Foundation of Nigeria, Green, White, Green, proudly so at all times. Thank we uh, thank you for being uh, with us. Dr. Undubusi Nwokolo of uh, Next Tire Security, Peace and Development. We uh, thank you also for your insights. And from our Kano Network Center, Executive Vice Chairman of the Kaduna State Peace Commission, Dr. Saleh Mamale, we appreciate your being around with us on Good Morning Nigeria today and for your suggestions as well. All right, so that's it for our conversation segment. It's quite interesting. We'll have the opportunity of returning to this subject matter uh, sometime. Uh, for now, uh, let's take our spots. England manager Gareth Southgate has signed a new contract to keep him in the role until December 2022.